On this special EM Cases podcast entitled Sepsis What Matters, recorded live from the February 2019 EM Cases course, in addition to the main guest expert Sarah Gray, I've interwoven Rob Samard of Pocus Cases videos to talk about IVC Pocus, Rory Spiegel to talk about the new Andromeda trial on serial lactates, George Kovacs, airway guru, to talk about awake intubation and septic shock, and Justin Morgenstern to talk about the new sensor trial on early norepinephrine. Now, the course was sold out so fast that we decided to add another course in Toronto on June 24th, 2019. Tickets should still be available through the EM Cases website under Courses. Now on to the live podcast. Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine live from the EM Cases course. On this special live podcast, sepsis, what really matters, we're gonna talk about six key aspects of sepsis that will probably save you a couple of lives each year. And to help us along, it's my distinct honor to have my friend and my former colleague, ED and ICU doc, co-author of the Canadian Sepsis Guidelines, Dr. Sarah Gray. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Anton. All right, so what are we going to cover? There's six things we're going to cover, right? Yep, six things. Uh, We're going to talk about how to best recognize sepsis early. Uh, Then we're going to talk about fluids, which ones are best, how much to give, when to give it. Yeah, we're going to talk about the best antibiotics to give because there's a lot of different kinds of patients out there and we need to give antibiotics quickly and when and how exactly to start pressors. Yep. Then we're going to talk a bit about lactate, pitfalls in interpreting your lactate uh, and a little bit about procalcitonin. And we'll wrap it up with Sarah's wish list for what she would want done in the emergency department before you transfer the patient to the ICU. So let's jump into a case. A 72-year-old retired stockbroker with a history of mild stroke, diabetes, and hypertension on a bladed blocker arrives via EMS from home at 9 p.m. on a Saturday night. He was seen in your ED two days prior with generalized weakness and intermittent confusion, normal blood work. He was diagnosed with a viral illness and sent home. Over the past 24 hours, he's been feeling increasingly weak and he can't get out of bed without help from his wife. On exam, he appears ill, dry, a bit dyspneic, but not mottled or cyanotic. He's alert enough, but his GCS is wavering between around 13 and 14. His vitals, temperature 37.3, Heart rate, 92. Respiratory rate, 24. Blood pressure, 100 on 60. Oxygen saturation of 95%. So based on this case so far, 72-year-old guy, doesn't look like he's in fluid septic shock, soft vitals. What's your differential diagnosis? Dr. Gray, any thoughts on what else to think about when you have the patient who looks septic, but before you jump into sepsis, what what else you need to think about? Yeah. So this guy's trickier, right? Because he doesn't have that fever. He's just weak and a bit altered with nonspecific findings. So you still need to keep your super broad differential. People measured sugar, a few metabolic things. Could this be DKA? Could this be subtle PE, subtle MI? Um, I mean, you guys know we're going towards sepsis because that's what this podcast is called. But up front, this could be many things. Okay. And what I'd like you to think about now is, is this patient septic? Are they in septic shock? Are you going to pull that trigger to immediately give antibiotics? Are you going to immediately give fluid boluses? Are you going to immediately order up lactates, blood cultures? So just think about that while we go through this. So, you know, sometimes septis, sepsis and septic shock can be obvious, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Uh, like in this case, what we're here to talk about is what's often missed leading to bad outcomes, and that's occult sepsis and septic shock, like this gentleman. So recognition of sepsis and septic shock is totally essential. So the question becomes, how do you recognize sepsis and sepsis shock 
and a 72-year-old diabetic without fever with vague presentation and just some soft vitals. There's really no troponin for sepsis, right? Yeah, I wish. So our current definition of sepsis, which comes from the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines, has three components to it, right? In in one sentence, it's that it's life-threatening organ dysfunction from a dysregulated host response to infection. And that's a whole mouthful, so it's hard for people to remember. But the three things you need are an infection, either documented or suspected. You need organ dysfunction, like this infection is hurting them in some way. And you as the clinician need to believe this is life-threatening. You need to think they're sick or potentially sick. And that's how you make the definition of sepsis today. Okay, so that's the definition. That's a little bit different than the recognition of sepsis. So we all remember the, the SERS criteria. Then there was the SOFA. Then the QSOFA and the NEWS criteria. Dr. Gray, how do we recognize sepsis and septic shock in 2019? Yeah, so here's how I do it. Um, First, I'm looking for that signs of infection. Do I think they have an infection driving their process? Number two, do I think they have organ dysfunction? Now, the guidelines here tell us to use the SOFA score, which I'm not sure we actually do very much in the emergency department, and I think that's okay. Technically, you're looking for a change in two of a SOFA score, but what I really do, practically speaking, is I look for organ dysfunction. So have they doubled their creatinine? Have they doubled their billy? Are they altered? Are they hypotensive? Uh, are their platelets half of what they ought to be? Any of those count as signs of organ dysfunction. And if I've recognized that, then I know they're potentially sick. And then I start looking for this life-threatening piece. And that's where all the scores come in, right? Because those scores are designed to help us tell, is this person really sick or not that sick? So we used to have uh, SIRS way back in the day. Um, That was good, but not very specific. And people don't use that very much anymore. QSOFA came out with sepsis 3. Uh, again, has been shown to be not that strong a predictor, so not commonly used. Uh, And the latest one that people are using is uh, the NEWS score, um, which is nice because you can just do it at triage. The NEWS score was news to me until I looked into it. The the latest study actually compared NEWS to QSOFA, Mm -hmm. and they actually found that it's more accurate. The beautiful thing is that you can, be, you can do it at triage because it's just basically the vitals and their level of awareness. So it's respiratory rate, uh, supplemental O2 requirement, temp, systolic blood pressure, heart rate, and level of awareness. So that's it. And this gentleman in our case would actually have a new score of eight, which is considered high risk. I think I might need some convincing to incorporate it into my practice. So tell us a little bit more about this recent study and the the evidence for NEWS. Okay, fair enough. So NEWS started out as a score to help us find sick people. It is not specific for sepsis. It's looking for people who are, have a high risk of dying on that hospital admission. So initially it was developed to help people call their CCRT or their MET teams effectively. But we're now seeing it used in sepsis to find that life-threatening group who might otherwise not look that sick, like our guy who's a bit weak and bit altered, but in the end has a very high news score. Uh, and so the latest study that was done on this in septic patients came out last year, Annals of Emergency Medicine, and they were comparing the news score to QSOFA to SIRS for identifying risk of dying from sepsis on that admission. News score was far uh, and away the better one with the best area under the receiver operating curve. And we're not going to go deep into the evidence here, uh, but certainly had the highest predictive value. And so there's good data that when you're looking at somebody with an infection and you're trying to decide, are they sick or not sick? The new score is the thing that can really help you make that decision appropriately. Great. And again, you can do it a triage. You actually don't even need your blood work yet to decide uh, when you've got the news. So this patient probably is septic with a high news score. The next important question to ask is, are they in septic shock? Okay. So then we have to know our definition for septic shock. The criteria are a bit more stringent now than they used to be. So in the latest guidelines, our criteria for septic shock is that you need to have hypotension that's not responsive to fluid resuscitation, plus a lactate greater than two, used to be four, now it's two, 
plus pressors. So you need to have adequately fluid resuscitated plus a high lactate plus pressors. That's your septic shock group now. So quite a sick group. Those people, when we look at this retrospectively, probably have an in-hospital mortality of about 40%. But that's the current definition of septic shock. And the question there, which comes up frequently and nobody knows the answer to, uh, is what is adequate fluid resuscitation? How much fluid do they need to have been given before you decide it's septic shock? That's a a well-planted seed. We're going to talk lots about that. Did you like that? It was great. Yeah, okay, good. So you just told me the definition of septic shock includes a lactate and keeping a map above 65 despite pressors, but... I mean, we're already way in already. You know, I want to I want to know earlier on if they're septic if they're in septic shock. And sometimes it's very obvious, but again, sometimes they can be in occult se- septic shock. How can you get that lactate back faster? How can you find out sooner whether your patient's in septic shock for the ones that aren't that obvious? Yeah. So at my place, we send the lactate with a venous gas. We do it on the syringe. And at our lab, you get those results very rapidly. They process the syringes faster. Uh, When we used to send them on a gray top tube, uh, it took an hour or more to get our lactate results back. So in the end, we actually took all of those gray top tubes out of our eMERGE. You can't send lactate that way anymore. Um, You've got to do it on a syringe and the results are more accurate and quick. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about lab, lab tests and sepsis. First, we know that lactate is useful to identify occult septic shock uh, in those patients who don't present an obvious septic shock. And just like troponin for MI, we need to know, though, that there are lots of false positives. So Dr. Gray, what are the most important false positives we should be aware of when it comes to high lactates? Okay. So probably the biggest one is liver failure or cirrhosis because that's how we clear our lactate. So it's going to Especially gonna... at St. Michael's Hospital. <laughs> Especially where I work. Uh, yeah, we do a lot of that. Anybody who's had a seizure is going to raise their lactate. Any type of shock or ischemia will raise your lactate, right? Not specific for sepsis alone. And then there are also medications that can give you a high lactate. Somebody who's been, uh, who went through a whole Ventolin puffer in one day, that alone will give you a type B lactic acidosis and give you a false positive. Knowing that there's some false positives, we know we, we want to trend the lactate. How do we actually use it? Yeah, so I will send it early, as I said, on a gas. If it is high, then I'm going to use that to guide my resuscitation. So I will trend it over the next several hours. Maybe I'll send the next one two or three hours later. Like I'm not sending it every 30 minutes or something. There's no value. But a couple hours later, check it again to make sure it's improving as I resuscitate this person. And I also use it as a marker of badness. If I've given this patient some resuscitation and their next lactate is higher, not lower, that is a real red flag for me that either I am vastly under resuscitating or I'm missing something. And that is the moment where I either get really serious or I call for help. It's a trigger for me that things are going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I've got to admit that I'll get my first lactate. It's a little bit elevated. I start resuscitating the patient. I get another lactate in two or three hours, and that one's a little bit more elevated. And I'm thinking, eh, I can handle this. I'll just resuscitate them a bit more. And then inevitably, the patient gets worse and worse and worse. And then I kick myself for not calling Sarah earlier. Yeah, just so call me. Call I, me sooner. I think that's one of the. That's going to be one of the key take-home points. Is if you have someone who's not doing well after your sort of initial resuscitation. That's really, you want to be getting your ICU colleagues involved early on rather than when it's too late. Absolutely. The other blood test that you might be hearing about, because we know that lactate's not perfect. As we just said, there's lots of false positives. Uh, The other one is procalcitonin. Is that something we should be using in our emergency departments? Yeah. So I don't think we need to worry about this yet in the eMERGE. I don't send it. I don't think there's a rule for you guys to send it. Uh, The data is not there yet that it's useful early on. There may be a rule for it later on in the ICU when we're trying to de-escalate antibiotics. Um, But up front, uh, I think for now, you can brain dump procalcitonin. You don't need to worry about it. All right. Yeah, you might be hearing more and more about procalcitonin. Apparently, it does sort of lack negative predictive value um, and that it's really only been studied in in respiratory patients. Yeah. But... It might be on the horizon. Keep your ears open. Just a quick interlude here. 
About a week after the EM case's course, JAMA published an RCT that called into question the value of using serial lactates to guide fluid resuscitation. The article entitled, Effect of a Resuscitation Strategy Targeting Peripheral Perfusion Status Versus Serum Lactate Levels on 28-Day Mortality Among Patients with Septic Shock, the Andromeda Shock RCT. So I invited my friend and co-host of the Journal Jam podcast, Rory Spiegel, a.k.a. EM Nerd, to give us his take on this RCT. The big question is, should we be using serial cap refill instead of serial lactate levels to guide fluid resuscitation in our septic shock patients? Hey, Anton, thanks for having me on. And what we're going to talk about today is the Andromeda Shock Trial. Now, this is a really fascinating study that was published in JAMA on February 17th of this year. And so this study looked at patients presenting in septic shock, and the patients were then randomized to one of two resuscitating strategies. So let's talk about a little bit about what they did and what it means. So this is a multi-center study. They looked at, at patients randomized over 20 different intensive care units over five countries, so pretty big. And they took patients presenting in septic shock, which they defined as a suspected infection, who were hypotensive after a 20 cc per kg fluid bolus and then required vasopressors to maintain a blood pressure. And not only that, they also had to have a serum lactate level of greater than two. So all in all, a pretty sick population. And so then these patients are randomized into one of two resuscitation protocols. And we'll kind of dive into the protocols, but essentially one was a peripheral perfusion protocol, which looked at normalizing capillary refill time. And the other was a lactate level guided protocol, which looked at normalizing or decreasing lactate levels. And so that was really how the two different groups were randomized. And what that meant was patients were put into a resuscitation strategy or pathway. Um, and this pathway started by assessing perfusion. And the clinicians assessed perfusion by one of two ways, either assessing capillary refill time or assessing lactate clearance. And if in either group, perfusion was deemed to be inadequate, so either capillary refill time was was prolonged or patients didn't clear their lactate appropriately, they were then entered into this resuscitation pathway. The first step of that resuscitation pathway was to assess for fluid responsiveness. And they did this by a number of means. So you could either do it by pulse pressure variation or VTI and so forth. But either way, they had some pretty well-validated ways of assessing for fluid responsiveness. And if the patient was deemed to be fluid responsive, they were given 500 cc's of fluid. After they were given fluid, perfusion was then reassessed, again, through either capillary refill time or lactate clearance, depending on whatever group they were randomized into. And so at this point, if perfusion was still inadequate, they again had an assessment of fluid responsiveness. And patients were continued to be given 500 cc fluid boluses until one of two things happened. Either they were no longer fluid responsive or their organ perfusion was deemed to be adequate. Now, if the patients were found to no longer be fluid responsive, but they still had either a prolonged capillary real full time or weren't clearing their lactate, they moved on to the next step of the protocol. And this was what was called a vasopressor test. And so they looked at the patients and they tried to assess whether they had hypertensive, and they were hypertensive in normal life before they became septic. And if there were signs that the patients had hypertension, they did what was a MAP push. So they increased the patient's vasopressors until they reached a MAP of 85. They wanted to assess if increasing the MAP would fix the perfusion deficit, either by fixing capillary real full time or lactate, depending on the group. If that didn't work, they moved on to the next step of the protocol, which was an ionodilator test, so using something like dubunamine, again, to see if it fixed end organ perfusion deficits in the form of fixing capillary refill or normalizing or decreasing lactate. So that was essentially the protocol between the two groups. And the only real difference was how you entered into the pathway. But everything else in the resuscitation protocol was about the same. And so they ended up randomizing a little over 400 patients at 424 patients into the two groups. And what they found was really interesting. The, technically, there was no statistical difference between the peripheral perfusion targeted strategy or the, or the strategy that, that targeted capillary refill time or the lactate level strategy. 
the p-value is 0.06. But there was a noticeable trend toward increased mortality in the patients in the lactate group. So patients who were randomized to lactate-guided strategy had a mortality of 43.4% versus only 34.9% in the capillary refill time group. And that's an 8.5% difference in mortality. Not statistically significant. And if you dive in and look, they had powered their study to show a 15% difference, which is an incredibly high difference. I mean, you could never imagine getting a 15% difference in mortality in a modern sepsis trial. So there was no way they were going to really find that kind of benefit. But the question is, how do we interpret a study like this? Now, you could take it the simple frequentist method and say, neither method was shown to be superior than the other, and they're essentially clinically equivalent. Or you could say something like, it looks like using a capillary refill time resuscitation strategy is superior to lactate, and this trial was just underpowered to demonstrate that. And that way, using the capillary refill time strategy is probably the optimal way to go if you're going to choose between these two strategies. But there's also another question. Is either one of these strategies the optimal way of resuscitating a patient in septic shock? And that, obviously, this trial can't answer, but it does bring up some curious questions. So why was the lactate-driven strategy so much worse than the peripheral perfusion strategy if we're going to believe this is not just statistical chance? Now, you could argue that we've known for some time now that lactate is not a direct marker of end organ malperfusion or tissue hypoxia. In fact, most of the lactate elevation we see in early sepsis is due to the increased sympathetic response driven by the infection itself. And so we're using a target that doesn't really represent what we think it represents. And so maybe we're not resuscitating people appropriately because of that. But if you actually look at the groups, what happened between them was the lactate-driven resuscitation strategy received more fluid, more vasopressors, more inodilators than the capillary refill group, meaning they got more stuff. So maybe the reason that the lactate-driven strategy did worse was simply because it forced the clinician's hand to do more resuscitation when we didn't need to. You know, over the years now, we're seeing trial after trial show that Patients in septic shock do worse when you do more stuff to them. This is as far back as Schumeyer's study when he looked at supernormalizing hemodynamic goals in patients in septic fact and showed that it increased mortality. But earlier still, if you look at the FEAST data where we found that the pediatric patients presenting in septic shock who got fluid boluses did worse than patients that simply got a fluid infusion. And recent published Andrews trial in JAMA where they found that patients that were resuscitated to a goal-directed strategy with fluid boluses and pressors did worse than if you simply did slow infusions of fluid or no fluid at all. And so maybe the optimal strategy here is not one that corrects perfusion by looking at lactate or looking at capillary refill, but one that avoids trying to over-resuscitate the patient at all and simply looks to get source control and uses a damage control strategy where you do as little as you can to support the patient until source control is achieved. So what do we actually take from this study? Like I said, we can't say definitively that a capillary refill guided resuscitation strategy is superior to an approach that uses lactate clearance. In fact, we can't even say that either one is the optimal resuscitation strategy. But certainly what I think we can say is lactated guided therapy is not superior, right? And it may even cause harm. Given this trial, I think we really have to start thinking closely about continuing to mandate protocols that require clinicians to draw lactates and then draw repeat lactates and enforce them to resuscitate patients using heavy-handed fluid boluses to try to attempt to clear these lactates. That may be a harmful strategy, and that we certainly don't have any data to support. Anyway, that's my take on a really interesting study. I think we'll have more data coming out soon on some of these other resuscitative strategies with the ROSE trial and a number of other trials that look at early vasopressors and a fluid-restrictive approach to septic shock that may give us a little more information. Thanks, Anton. All right, now back to the live podcast with Sarah Gray. Let's move on to resuscitation fluid of choice. So I'll put out there to the audience... Uh, Your resuscitation fluid of choice in sepsis, is it normal saline? Is it ringer's lactate? 
Is it something else? So your initial fluid resuscitation of choice. Well, back in 2014, in episode 55, I think it was, with Walter and uh, with Scott Weingart, back then, based on their expert opinion, the evidence and kind of general consensus, what we said at that time was start with the fluid challenge of about two liters of normal saline or 30 milliliters per kilogram. Try and get that in over 30 minutes with a minimum of two large bore peripheral IVs under pressure bags pumped up to 300 millimeters of mercury. Then switch to Ringer's lactate and the reason being to avoid the acidosis that's associated with large volumes of normal saline. So since then, there's been a few studies, the uh, SALT-ED and the SMART trial. Dr. Gray, is that still true? Should we be giving a couple liters of normal saline and then ringers? What's your take on the current literature and the fluid of choice for sepsis and septic shock? So I would say it's very common these days to still give the two liters of saline up front in the eMERGE. Uh, I will tell you that is not my practice. I use ringers for almost everybody up front all the time. And that's partly because that's the ICU fave for resuscitation. We hate saline and we hate it for two common reasons. One is the metabolic acidosis that we talked about. So if you have a septic patient who's acidotic to start and then you give them a bunch of saline, which makes them more acidotic, we are increasing their risk of death and lowering their chance of surviving that admission. But the other thing we dislike about saline is the fact that that chloride load is a renal vasoconstrictor. The chloride in saline reduces your renal perfusion. So the organ you're trying to save is not being saved effectively when you choose a fluid with that much chloride in it. And this is why when you look at all of these studies, in fact, they look at renal outcomes very carefully because we know the impact of chloride on your renal outcomes. And so do you want to talk the studies? Yeah, sure. So normal saline, bad for kidneys. Bad for kidneys. Okay, so there's, there's and I this... like kidneys. <laughs> you like them too, well, probably. They're hard to fix. They're, I mean, they're fixable, but it's it's they're a very, challenge. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the, there's the Salt ED and the yeah. Smart Trials. We'll do the Emerge one first, right? We should always do the Emerge one first. Uh, so Salt ED. These trials came out last year in New England, single center crossover trials, and what they looked at in Salt ED was all Emerge patients who got admitted to the ward. So you had to get admitted somewhere, and it had to be non-ICU where you were admitted, and they were randomized on alternating months to either saline or what they called a balanced crystalloid, which was mostly ringers. There was 5% plasma light in there, but 95% ringers lactate. And then they looked at outcomes. And this was in a lot of people, right? 13,000 people or so in the salt ED trial. So when you look at their primary outcome, which was hospital-free days, there was no difference which sort of translates to no difference in length of stay. Mortality was not their primary outcome. Their secondary outcome was MAKE30, which is the major adverse kidney events in 30 days. It's a mouthful, right? I'm going to say that again, major adverse kidney events in 30 days. And in that outcome, they didn't do as well in the saline group, right? That was a significant difference that they had. And the MAKE30 is made up of death, dialysis, or increasing your creatinine to 200% of your baseline death, dialysis, or a big creatinine bump. That's what the MIG-30 is. So that was different, right? And these are in people who have only had a liter and a half of crystalloid. That's how much they were getting. They weren't getting big resuscitations. The average amount of fluid was a liter and a half. Uh, just and that is enough to give them higher rates of dialysis. You know, it just occurred to me, Dr. Gray, that uh, the quote, contrast-induced nephropathy when the radiologist calls us and says, oh, you better give that patient a liter bolus of normal saline for our uh, totally. patient whose creatinine isn't so yes. good. Perhaps that's what's getting our patients in bad shape when they... Right. Well, and when, when they, they looked at the subgroups in SALT-ED, the people who had a bit of a creatinine bump in the first place were the ones who did the worst, right? So if you have that person who has a bit of a creat bump, saline is the worst choice for those people. Now, SALT-ED didn't look at sepsis specifically, so let's turn to the SMART trial. Same issue of New England, same place. These were all the people who went through the eMERGE and then went to the ICU, and they were also on alternating months either getting saline or mostly ringers lactate. 
This was also thousands of people, but they had a pre-specified subgroup of septic people, and that's what we're really interested in, 2,000 septic people. When you look at that group, specified a priority, big significant mortality difference. 25% mortality in the ringer's lactate group, 29% mortality in the saline group. If you've got somebody with sepsis going to your ICU, giving them ringers up front instead of saline saves lives. Saves a big number of lives, in fact. So if you're at a place where saline gets hung first, I think that is what it is, uh, but maybe you think about switching to ringers sooner rather than later because there is mortality data here in that subgroup. All right. I- I'm pretty convinced for ringers up front in sepsis. Are there going to be any situations where you want to avoid ringers? Sure. So the main group where I avoid ringers is traumatic brain injury, where I want to keep the sodium high. Or people with high ICP problems, I also want to keep the sodium high there. Saline is a lovely choice, has more sodium. All right. So we've answered which fluid of choice. The next question becomes, how much fluid should we be giving up front? There seems to be competing evidence for liberal versus restrictive fluids uh, in sepsis. Uh, So liberal would be like four to six liters of fluid and then starting pressors versus two to three liters and then started pressors earlier. What fluid resuscitation strategy do you think is best? So this is always the tricky answer because I want to give you the cookbook, right? I want to tell you you can give everybody two liters and that's going to be perfect, except it's not true. So here we need a bit of the Goldilocks strategy. We want to give not too little, not too much. We want to give just the right amount for that individual to perfuse their end organs. And this varies for everybody, but we're shooting for a map greater than 65 and perfusing them, making urine, mentating, all of those good things. All right. And in our diabetic patient with a history of hypertension on a beta blocker, who's a bit tacky and his blood pressure again is 100 on 50, how much fluid would you give this gentleman? Yeah, same answer. I'm giving him however much he needs to make urine uh, and wake up. Fair enough. Okay, so the answer for how much is, it depends on organ perfusion. What if the patient also had a history of CHF? And maybe if they, maybe they even had a little bit of crackles at the bases. Totally. And so we see this all the time. This is, I, ha- I, have a, I have a pet peeve, Anton. Uh, these people still need the same amount of fluid. They still need enough fluid to mentate and to make urine and to have a decent map. And if that means you need to intubate them, then that means you need to give them the appropriate aggressive life support that they require to survive this sepsis admission. Under resuscitating, CHF patients just kills them slowly. Just means the kidneys and the liver will be dead by tomorrow. And it won't be your problem because it'll be somewhere else, uh, but it is an effective way to knock off multiple organs. So we've talked about which fluid, we've talked about how much. The next question is how fast we should be running uh, our ringer's lactate. Okay, fast. Faster rather than slower. So definitely multiple IVs for these people, wide open, preferably with a pressure bag, particularly in that sick subgroup. Dripping it in through a 22 in their hand over the next four hours is not an effective strategy. All right. So who here has a level one infuser in their department? Okay. Who here has uh, just bags of ringers and lactate? No infuser? Okay. Who here has pressure bags? Everyone's got pressure bags. So one thing I can, I can say that I've seen quite a bit is, you know, I want two liters of ringers lactate as fast as they can go in. You got two good peripheral IVs and they're just drip, drip, drip. I just grab the pressure bags and just pump them up and start them right away. Those pressure bags are key. Yeah, it can be a human pressure bag. Like we can just squeeze. Sure. Uh, it goes faster. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the other thing is that there are some contraindications to running ringers with some medications. Uh, for example, ceftriaxone, which we might use quite often in sepsis. So the nice thing about using ringers is that it actually forces the nurses to put in two lines because they have to run ceftriaxone in one and they have to run the ringers in the other, right? Absolutely. Right. So it 
or three lines, two for fluid, one for meds. Um, but yes, you can't put ceftriaxone through your ringer's line. Uh, so that's an important caveat. And some of the formulations of Piptazo can't go with ringers, but that's not the one we normally stock in Canada. Most Canadian Piptazo formulations are compatible with ringers. Okay. So for the listeners in the U.S., they should check the type of Piptazo yep. that they have. So that's a bit about which fluids, how much, and how fast. That brings us to the endpoint of fluid resuscitation, which sounds simple, but I can tell you that it's not because there's so many factors to consider to figure out whether your patient uh, has been adequately resuscitated or not. So I'll put it out there to the audience. What's your endpoint of resuscitation? So when are you satisfied that you've given enough ringers? Signs of end organ perfusion. Okay, good urine output. Old school, I like that. Mentation's improving, okay. Lactate, good. So you want their lactate to be trending down. IVC, plumpness, collapsibility. Is anyone using ultrasound for, for determining your endpoint of fluid resuscitation? Yes. So uh, Dr. Samard, who has been the incredible brain behind uh, POCUS cases, the videos on EM cases, we've got about eight videos so far. He's going to tell us a little bit about the value of checking the IVC and determining your endpoint of resuscitation. So the beauty part about IVC for in, in POCUS in your septic patients is it's dynamic and it changes as you resuscitate the patient. <laughs> so the initial ultrasound in a patient who's going to need some fluid, you'll usually see a very flat, very collapsing IVC. And this is a patient that as you start to fill the pipes up, uh, you're going to start to see that the IVC will become fatter and fatter and collapse less. And that could be a marker of how well you're fluid resuscitating the patient. So the, the beautiful part is the dynamic part of things. You can actually see if you're actually improving the patient as you go. And if you've given that, you know, magical two liters that we've always been taught, um, and part of, part of what I definitely agree with Sarah is that not every patient needs two liters of fluid is that maybe one liter is all you need. Maybe you need more than two liters. Maybe you need three liters. And the IVC can potentially be a useful tool in helping determine that. All right. I think some of the naysayers out there might say, well, the accuracy is not that great. You know, you could see what looks like a plump IVC when they're actually fluid depleted and vice versa. So there's, there's false positives, false negatives. It's not so accurate. Maybe it's a data point, but I'm not going to hang my hat on the IVC. I, I would 100% agree with that. So remember, it's just another data point. Um, there's a lot of things that can affect the IVC. So pericardial effusions affect the IVC. The amount of uh, abdominal distension can affect the IVC. That's multifactorial. It can affect the IVC. So it, it is just another data point. And if that data point's not following what uh, your brain is saying during the resuscitation, so you're saying, huh, this just doesn't make sense, I would say use your other data points that you have. It's, it's one data point and a set of many data points in helping your resuscitation. All right. So that being said, thank you very much, Dr. Samard. That being said about IVC, that it's just one data point, Dr. Gray, give us the answer. What is your endpoint of fluid resuscitation? You know, you've got the um, passive leg raise test. You've got the IVC. You've got old school stuff like urine output. What's kind of a simple way when we're in the emergency department, we're rushing around and we just want to figure out, okay, when are we done resuscitating this person? Oh, we're never done, Anton. It's never over. Uh, but I would echo what Rob said, that you need multiple endpoints. Just choosing one thing and tracking it will lead you astray. Uh, so I like the map. I like the GCS. I like the urine output. Those are my big three clinical endpoints. I do a lot of IVC ultrasound, so I'll add that in there as often as I can. And those are things that I will go back and reassess after every liter or two or three of fluid to know when I'm hitting adequate resuscitation. All right. I love that. So MAP, GCS, urine output, pretty old school, simple and effective. Thank you. I Excellent. think you called me old, but I'm doing okay. <laughs> well, we're the same age. So I know. That's I, why it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So in terms of assessing how they're doing, do you put a Foley in all these patients? Absolutely. Foley's for everybody. Foley's for everyone. Foley's okay. for everybody. Not okay. the ankle sprains. 
Foley's <laughs> for all the septic everybody's. All right. So th- that's something that uh, I guess from an ICU perspective, sometimes they forget to do in the emergency department. That would be nice to do. Have a Foley in there. Yeah. I mean, it, it, so I, and I am pretty old school, Anton. Um, but like even my septic people who are going to the ward, right? They've got a pneumonia. I'm not sure how well their volume resuscitated. In my opinion, those people need a Foley because urine output is a great way to make sure they have enough fluid on board. And that prevents them bouncing into the ICU on day two from under resuscitation. All right. So one of our endpoints of resuscitation is the MAP. And 65 seems to be the magic number. And that seems to have been kind of the standard, which isn't really based on any hardcore evidence. And there's some folks out there who believe that, at least in young, otherwise pretty healthy people, uh, who probably walk around with blood pressures of 110 on 60, that we should actually be shooting for a MAP that's lower than that, maybe 60, 55, 50. Any thoughts on that? Right. So I think if you don't know this patient, 65 is always a safe choice. If you have documented evidence that this person always lives at a map of 55 and you've seen that on multiple visits, I think it's okay to move your target down. And similarly, if you can see on multiple visits that they live at a map of 75 because their blood pressure is always 240 or whatever it is, I think it's okay to move up a little bit if you have that data. But if you don't know, 65 is the safe choice. So we've talked a little bit about fluid choice, how much, how fast, and the endpoints of resuscitation. That leads us very nicely into when to start norepinephrine and how much to give. So first question is, what are the indications for norepinephrine? I find it actually sometimes difficult because, say, in this gentleman, uh, let's say his MAP is kind of around 65, but he's on a beta blocker. I've given him, let's say, a liter of ringers, but... His GCS isn't so great. Sometimes these are really tough decisions. What what are the indications for giving norepinephrine and sepsis? So certainly anytime the MAP is less than 65, I think you have a solid indication. And that may be while you are still volume resuscitating, but I think it's not unreasonable to start early. And if you volume resuscitate them and the MAP improves, you can stop your norepi. So when you say start early... If the patient comes in with a MAP of 50, you're starting norepinephrine like the second they come through the door? So practically speaking, I'm getting the IVs first, and then I'm hanging my ringers, and then I'm giving them norepinephrine. So is it the very minute they come in the door? No, but I am faster than many other. I won't hang around with them at a MAP of 50 and let an hour or two go by. All right. Um, And I understand that there's... Uh, a trial that's in progress now called the Clovers trial that might actually give us an exact answer to this question. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So Clovers is comparing um, early pressors and restrictive fluids versus liberal fluids and later pressors. So it's going to give us more data about this, um, which will be hugely useful, but probably uh, not till the end of the year, maybe early next year. Another quick interlude here. There was an additional important article that came out after the EM cases course called the Sensor Trial, C-E-N-S-E-R. And it looked at giving septic shock patients norepinephrine early, around 90 minutes after ED arrival, versus standard care, which turned out to be more like three hours after arrival. And they looked at how well shock was controlled at six hours, mortality, pulmonary edema, new dysrhythmia. Anyhow, I asked Justin Morgenstern to give us his take on this key trial. So we're talking sepsis, and we have a sepsis paper hot off the press. The question is, when should we start vasopressors on patients in septic shock? And the guidelines say we should give a fluid bolus first, 30 milligrams per kilogram, and then we can think about starting vasopressors. But there's always been some observational data saying that starting vasopressors earlier is better. And just this month, the sensor trial was published. And this is the first ever prospective randomized trial looking at vasopressors in sepsis. So in this trial, they took adult patients who had to be 18 or older with a mean arterial pressure less than 65 thought to be due to infection. They randomized them to either get norepinephrine, it was run at 0.05 micrograms per kilogram per minute, which would be about three to four micrograms in your average sized adult. And that was run without titration for 24 hours. It was compared to placebo. Both groups got normal protocol-driven sepsis management according to the 
2012 surviving sepsis campaign guidelines, which included antibiotics, uh, crystalloid fluid boluses, and source control. And you could use open label vasopressors if your MAP was still below 65 after your 30 milligram per kilogram fluid bolus. The primary outcome that they were looking at here was shock control by six hours, which was defined as a MAP greater than 65 for more than 15 minutes, plus signs of adequate tissue perfusion, which was either a urine output greater than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour or a 10% decrease in lactate. They ended up randomizing 310 patients. These are relatively six patients with an Apache score of 20, a mean arterial blood pressure of 56, and a lactate of 2.8, and the two groups look pretty similar at the outset of the trial. And in terms of the primary outcome, this shock control by six hours, norepinephrine looked a lot better. Shock control was 76% as compared to only 48% in the placebo group. Maybe more importantly, mortality was also better in the norepinephrine group, 16 versus 22%, although this outcome was not statistically significant. Basically, all of the secondary outcomes also favored norepinephrine, and there were none of the things that we worry about with vasopressors, including no extra gut or limb ischemia, and the rate of renal replacement was the same in both groups. Now, this is not a perfect trial. It's a single-center trial with a relatively small number of patients. The trial took place in Thailand, and about half of these patients, despite being on a vasopressor, were not treated in the ICU, so it's not clear exactly how well this will extrapolate to Western settings. The most important criticism of this trial is that their primary outcome is not a patient-oriented outcome. Raising the blood pressure or seeing a decrease in lactate are not outcomes that matter to the patient. I like urine output as a reasonable surrogate, but... Your patient doesn't care how much they were peeing in the ICU if it doesn't lead to better outcomes after the ICU. Now, in this case, the outcomes after the ICU were probably better. Mortality looks like it might be improved, and you can't do much better than that in septic shock. Now, as a quick aside, it's really interesting to note that in about 60% of this cohort, norepinephrine was actually run through a peripheral IV. So in some ways, this actually functions as a randomized control trial of peripheral norepinephrine, and there was no difference in skin necrosis between the two groups. So what do we do with this data? It's a small, single-centered trial, but with a fairly big improvement in the primary outcome with norepinephrine. Well, the EBM bottom line here, it's probably too early to be changing sepsis protocols. We really need to see a large, multi-center RCT. But the question is, what do you do in the meantime? I'm still going to be starting all my patients with an IV fluid bolus, but I think the data here is strong enough to mean that I'm going to be reaching for norepinephrine earlier than I have been. Not before the fluid bolus, but I'm not going to necessarily wait for the full 30 milliliters per kilogram to drip in through a, let's admit, not great IV before I decide to pull the trigger on vasopressors. I know that's not a definitive answer, but this isn't a definitive trial, so it's the best you're going to get. That's all for this time. And now back to the live podcast with Sarah Gray. We've talked about when to give norepinephrine, and we know that norepinephrine is your first choice. The next question is the dosing, how much to give. We know that we can give norepinephrine through a peripheral line safely and quickly if we do it carefully and through a big proximal IV and we make sure that we add hourly extremity checks just to be safe. So we don't need a central line for all these patients right away. It isn't an immediate priority. How about the dosing of norepinephrine? So how do you actually titrate the dosing? So you start at whatever the low end of your range is at your place. And different hospitals will have different dosing ranges, but many of them start around either five mics per minute, or if you're a mics per kilo per minute place, uh, often you're starting around 0.01 or maybe 0.05, something in that range. You start low, but then this is something you can dial up every minute or two based on their blood pressure. So every time you're doing, even with your peripheral cuff, you do a cuff pressure, they're still low, you turn it up again. Do a cuff pressure, they're still low, you turn it up again. So this is something I titrate over the first five minutes at the bedside. This is not something where you walk away for an hour and then you come back and say, oh, they're still low. You will be very responsive to norepinephrine. It's quick. Right. So this isn't the geriatric rule of start low, go slow. This is start low, go fast. 
Yes. Got it. <laughs> All right. Everything faster. And then let's say you've dialed up your norepinephrine. Uh, let's say you're getting up to like 30 mics a minute. Okay. Pretty high dose there. When do you actually decide to add a second presser? And if you do decide to add a second presser, what presser is that going to be? Right. So guidelines tell us vasopressin should be the second presser that you add. And we typically add it at moderate dose norepinephrine, uh, which at my place would be like a 0.5 mic per kilo per minute, uh, or that would be a 35 mics per minute if you're 70 kilos. Somewhere in that range is where we add vasopressin, usually at a, a basal rate of 2.4 units per hour, or that's 0.04 units per minute. And you want to add it before you've maxed out your levo, right? Because vasopressin is thought to be a norepinephrine sparing agent. Uh, so you want to add it and get that benefit before you've hit your local maximum of your norepinephrine dose. All right. So if, if there's sort of a magic number to know when thinking about starting vasopressin, it's 35 mics per minute of norepinephrine that's when you should be starting to pull out the, the vasopressin. Yep, in that ballpark. No great data for when to start, but that would be common practice. All righty. Now, we know that with each passing hour that antibiotics are not initiated in septic shock, that survival drops precipitously. It's kind of a time bomb. So this might not be the case for sepsis without septic shock because there's been some more recent studies that show that giving those antibiotics so quickly isn't that important unless they're actually in shock. Nonetheless, this did prompt the newest um, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines to mandate in the United States that antibiotics are given within one hour of the patient hitting triage for anyone suspected of sepsis or septic shock as part of their sepsis management bundle. Now, there was this huge backlash against this because for various reasons. One is we'd end up giving all these very expensive antibiotics to people who don't need them, that we might even get distracted from the other diagnosis that we're missing because we just start thinking sepsis right away and give them all antibiotics. Uh, it leads to increased drug resistance, especially pneumococcal drug resistance, which is probably the worst of the worst. And then also a review article in the annals a few months back, it actually showed that there's really no evidence for improved survival for this one-hour management bundle. So, Dr. Gray, what do you recommend in terms of the timing of antibiotics for patients in septic shock uh, and in patients like the gentleman in, in our case who isn't in fluid septic shock but we suspect might be going that way? Right. So, current guidelines say they need to be administered within an hour of triage which means inside the patient within that hour, not ordered in your CPOE within that hour, right? Subtle difference there. But I would say most people are not practicing that way. ASEP has refused to endorse that guideline, and there's been significant pushback about whether or not this is, one, safe, and two, feasible. Uh, so my personal practice is to have the antibiotics in within an hour of making the diagnosis. That is how I practice. So I want to be very clear that that does not match the current surviving sepsis guidelines, but my practice is common, but just one person's opinion. All right. And in the patient who's in fluid septic shock, you're going to be making that diagnosis very quickly. Yep. So that's going to happen in an hour. That's not a problem. And I'm still shooting for within an hour of my diagnosis. Right. And if that happens to be within an hour of triage, bravo, but I don't personally worry about the triage time but I tend to give them rapidly once I've made that decision. Certainly the best evidence for that is in septic shock, less of a push in just sepsis. All right. So we also know from a study out of CHEST back in 2009 that inappropriate antibiotic choice decreases survival in sepsis. So it's super important to choose your antibiotics wisely. You know, it shouldn't just be piptase and vancomycin for every patient, right? Some patients are on chemo, some patients are on dialysis, uh, some patients have neck fash. There's, there's all kinds of factors that you have to consider in there. How should we be choosing antibiotics in septic patients? 
Right. And so on top of the patient factors, there are also hospital factors, right? Different hospitals in different locations are going to have different resistance rates. So I think it's really important to work with your ID service to decide what are going to be the empiric choices at your place. Uh, because they will know your local antibiogram. And that way you can specify and ideally even build into your CPOE, this is what we're going to use for pneumonia. This is what we're going to use for UTI. This is what we're going to use for meningitis. Because it varies across hospitals. But we know if we just go piptazovanc for everybody, one, we're not treating necessarily all the things we want to treat. We're going to miss the Legionella. We're going to miss some of the meningitis stuff. Uh, but two, our resistance rates are going to skyrocket. Absolutely. All right. So that actually highlights the importance of really searching aggressively for that source of infection early on uh, as best you can. Now, some of us love push dose pressors when the shit hits the fan in the resuscitation room. What about push dose antibiotics? Is there any reason not to just slam in that piptase or the ceftriaxone? The challenge in sepsis is many hospital protocols dictate how fast the nurses can administer antibiotics. Uh, they usually have to be over a minimum of half an hour, and they can't be given at the same time in case there is an allergic reaction. But as the physician, you have the option of giving them a lot faster or delegating that act to your nurses, depending on those relationships. So we give all our ceftriaxone in over five minutes. Uh, you can give piptazo over five minutes. Uh, you do not need to give them slow, and it makes it much easier to hit that one-hour administration time. Now, you need to be careful with a couple things. Vanco is slow, right? Vanco is slow. We don't push that one. Uh, and the other option, if you're looking at speed, is to think about, you know, could this patient take an oral drug? If you're ordering something like Cipro and you know the bioavailability of Cipro orally is the exact same as the IV, why not give it to them PO, which is extremely rapid, while you're giving something else through the intravenous? So there are a bunch of workarounds, but it's worth it to be thoughtful about how you're going to give these in a timely manner. Um, and it's worth it to give your best drug first, right? When time matters, give whatever you think your best drug is first and get it in and working on the patient. So most of these IV antibiotics, you, you can push. Yep. Vanco goes slow. Uh, and think about alternatives for high bioavailability oral drugs that you can get going in there while the IV is running some other drug. Absolutely. Now, talking about things that are in high debate, the one over steroids and septic shock has been going on now since most of us were in diapers, actually. There's one study that says, yes, give steroids, then the next study says, no, don't give steroids, and then another one says, yes, and it's back and forth and back and forth. The latest studies, there's the, the adrenal and the approach SS studies. They were uh, just from last year. They were also contradictory. One said yes, one said no. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Gray, can you give us the bottom line on which patients, if any, should receive steroids for septic shock in the ED? Right. So nobody knows what to do. And all the guidelines say, we don't know what to do. So the beauty of this is you as the clinician get to make the choice of what you want to do. And you will see huge variation in practice, both in the emergency department and in the ICU. For me personally, when that patient is on two pressors and still tanking, I give steroids. That is my personal approach. Some people will give steroids up front. Some people will never get, give steroids ever. The data does not give us an answer. You do you. Patients who are in pressor-resistant shock probably need steroids. I'm hoping by that time that the patients in your ICU, Sarah, are not still in the emergency department. <laughs> I don't know what your wait times are, but these people are still in my eMERGE. Oh, boy. All right. And then, of course, there's the patient who's, on st who's steroid dependent. So stress dose steroids, yes. Two thumbs up for that for people who are already on a steroid at baseline. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So bottom line, give steroids for pressor refractory shock and patients who are on steroids. Now that brings up the question of Atomidate, which is another huge controversy. You know, maybe Atomidate causes adrenal suppression, right? So do you avoid Atomidate like the plague or, uh, you know, it's a great drug in terms of its hemodynamic stability. Why not use Atomidate for your patients in septic shock? 
Right. So I avoid a dominate because at my place, you've got to do paperwork uh, when you use it. Um, so that's my the, my main barrier. Um, and for this, I just don't know about the adrenals. So I use ketamine instead. It's easy and there's no paperwork. Okay. And since we have one of Canada's leading airway experts in the room, uh, Dr. Kovacs, I'd like to ask you, George, traditionally for the septic patient, your average septic patient in the emergency department, it's RSI, 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 RSI. Is there any time that you'd consider an awake intubation in a patient who's septic, septic shock? This patient represents a, a triple threat. Uh, you know, our septic patients, it's not uncommon that they're, they're potentially hemodynamically unstable, not uncommon that it's a respiratory so source, so they're hypoxemic, and that they're acidotic. So they don't represent a, a traditional difficult airway from an anatomic or a pathologic point of view. But they are a difficult airway. They're, they're difficult physiology. And that's really what, what they've been talking about. If you look at their presentation of this patient, based on the initial vitals, they had a shock index of 0.9. And we know if we intubate that patient with that shock index, a high incidence of bad things happening, including cardiac arrest afterwards. So really all the stuff that uh, we've already been hearing about, about resuscitate your, your patient first. These patients don't get don't get better from a, a tube in their, in, their, in their trachea. In fact, they're, they're often will, will get worse at that point because we're doing positive pressure ventilation. With positive pressure ventilation, we're decreasing venous return. We're increasing their afterload. They've lost their sympathetic drive, right, that endogenous catechols that are there. And we're using an induction agent that's potentially going to bottom out their, their blood pressure. So some people would say that an awake approach where you avoid these things may be the way to go. I don't think in general you're going to do about that, but I'll talk about that more this afternoon. Getting back to the steroids thing, it's actually worse than what we were saying before in terms of the yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, because uh, there was a fairly recent large study that looked at not just steroids, but steroids and thiamine and vitamin C for patients with sepsis. And it kind of makes sense because we know that these patients are very depleted uh, when it comes to vitamin C and thiamine. So it kind of makes sense to replace them. And this study actually showed a mortality benefit. So now what do we do? Do we give thiamine and vitamin C and steroids to everyone with septic shock? So we don't yet. This study was really interesting. It was Paul Merrick's work uh, about this metabolic cocktail. Um, but this is a non-randomized, non-blinded, uh, observational effect that they've noticed in his ICU. Uh, so this is fabulous in terms of hypothesis generation, and this has triggered about 20 different RCTs which are going on globally to assess this precise question. Um, we don't know yet. So this is not yet standard of care, and we're waiting for those trials to come out. And if you feel like having a little extra vitamin C in the meantime, go for it. Um, but we don't know the answer yet. So, Sarah's wish list. So, as an intensivist, you receive many, 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 many septic patients from the ED and have been for, we won't say how many years. If you give every emergency doctor out there a wish list of stuff that you want done before the patient's transferred to the ICU, what, what would that wish list look like? Okay. So, number one. I am always super impressed by the eMERGE doc who catches the subtle cases because it's really easy to make the septic shock diagnosis and it's really easy to decide when somebody's perfectly well. It's the ones in the middle, like this guy who has a bit of a soft blood pressure and is a bit altered. And then when you actually do the new score, you realize how sick they are and that they probably deserve an ICU bed, right? So I like when people are using news or whatever score they prefer to find those subtle cases so we can resuscitate them effectively. Number two, big fan of early antibiotics, given faster rather than slower, and chosen with some thought. Number three, ringers, more ringers than saline. Maybe an earlier shift to ringers if you're going to start with saline, but certainly I would advocate for that because kidneys are valuable and I like saving them. Number four, norepi. Norepi, even if it's early, 
Um, you don't have to wait to give them two or three or four liters of crystalloid before you start the norepi. It is acceptable to support their blood pressure long before that. And last, yeah, if you're, I would go back to that first point you made, Anton, where when you're doing your repeat lactate and it's going up, that is a sign of badness. Uh, and consider calling your ICU then. Calling us earlier rather than later helps us resuscitate the patient at that point where it's really of benefit from them. All right. So what really matters in sepsis? Just to reiterate, use news. The latest news is news for subtle cases. So basically the vital signs plus GCS. You don't need your uh, lactate yet even for that. Early antibiotics, IV push. So push all those IV antibiotics except for Vanco. Search for the cause. Choose wisely based on local resistance patterns. It's not PIP, TAS, and Vanco for everyone. Uh, basically, you can forget normal saline except for your head injured patient who happens to be septic. Use ringers right from the get-go. Uh, and even if they're in acute heart failure, you can use ringers. Start norepinephrine whenever the MAP is less than 65. They actually may require ringers and norepinephrine right off the bat, you know, if their MAP is 50. If lactate is rising, use your lifeline and get your patient up to the ICU as soon as possible. And with that, we'll conclude our live podcast at the EM Cases course. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your insightful comments, your wisdom, and <laughs> uh, for all of you, for the great questions and your input. Until next time, take it easy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.